Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Bandan Das. Uh, I am a virtualization engineer at Red Hat. Um, and uh, today we, we are going to be talking about uh, the state of fuzzing in, uh, in QMU. Uh, so with me, I have um, um, Alex, uh, who works at Red Hat Research and, and is also a PhD student at Boston University. Um, uh, and Alex works on fuzzing. Alex, would you want to give a quick introduction? Sure. Uh, so I, I started working on, um, on QMU in, uh, in 2019 during the Google Summer of Code. Uh, specifically, I was, I, I was working on uh, uh, building out a framework for fuzzing virtual devices, and I've stuck around since then. And uh, I think it's a very exciting topic, and I hope you enjoy our talk. All right. Thanks, Alex. So let's move on. So, um, so before we talk about fuzzing, uh, so the first slide just talks a little bit about QMU and how we decided on what would be a good interface to fuzz. Uh, not that uh, QMU does not have a lot of in interesting, uh, you know, interfaces. Uh, QMU is a vast, uh, you know, emulator. It's it's there are there are millions of interfaces through which uh, guests interact, um, but. Uh, this in, this slide just talks a little bit about what are the more interesting interfaces that um, where where fuzzing can uh, you know um, benefit QMU. So um, as you all know, QMU is an emulator. Uh, it can work with uh, KVM. It can work with uh, DCG, uh, and uh, a, a big chunk of QMU is basically implementing virtual devices, which enable guest environments to do I/O of some sort. Um, so these uh, devices could be actual uh, implementations of, you know, um, like emulations of real hardware, or they can also be para-virtualized, like uh, for, like for IO devices. So if you look at the figure on the right, um, we see we show a very very uh, you know simplified version of uh, you know the hypervisor that's uh, you know uh, sitting on top of hardware, and there's this virtual virtual devices layer, uh, and then we have guest devices basically running on top of the hypervisor um, with their own apps running in this sandbox that uh, the hypervisor has provided. Now, due to a uh, attack surface that's probably lurking in somewhere in the virtual device layer, uh, a malicious um, app um, can, uh, if it knows about this, um, you know, this, this um, attack surface, the a malicious app can try to take advantage of it. Now, the app itself uh, is malicious, but the guest OS might not be necessarily so. So the guest might be an unwilling uh, you know, participant in exposing some interfaces that the app can use to escape out of the sandbox that QMU has provided. Now, so this just basically shows how uh, you know, the virtual device layer that, uh, that's being exposed by QMU is very, very critical. It needs to be hardened on a continuous basis and we always need to kind of be one step ahead of um, you know any uh, any vulnerabilities that might ex get exposed out in the wild. So um, with that, let's move on to a little bit of discussion about uh, you know the basic code analysis techniques, right? Uh, so basically, there are two kinds of uh, you know code inspection uh, techniques that you can think of. Uh, the first one is uh, static analysis, where you basically use this program, spe special program called a static analyzer to uh, you know, feed in your test program. And then the static analyzer, based on a set of rules, uh, basically checks for inconsistencies in syntax or semantics. Uh, and the advantage of a static analyzer is basically that you don't have to make major changes or probably no changes at all to your uh, test program uh, because you are essentially running your test program offline. And there's also this uh, well-known, um, you know, uh, fact that uh, you, you get a lot of, um, you know, false positive with static analyzers. And the way to get around that is basically by teaching your static analyzer speci specialized rules, how to kind of, you know, um, detect uh, certain things. Like for example, your code might be written in such a way that uh, even if the, the variable seems uninitialized uh, in, 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 in the, it's just basically impossible for the code logic to actually use it uninitialized. And those are the kind of things where, you know, uh, you might get some kind of false positive, false positives from static analyzers. Now, the other uh, technique, which is 
which is basically where fuzzing falls is dynamic analysis. And that is uh, where, you know, you actually change your, um, uh, you know, test program and integrate, you know, specialized, uh, you know, input paths, which basically allow your test program to, um, you know, go through a series of very, very various inputs. And so that what this does is it allows coverage of all the test paths that your test program can take. And as you as you can already see, this definitely is a more intrusive approach than uh, than static analysis. Um, and uh, there might be false positives also with dynamic analysis. But uh, suffice it to say that when you when you're doing dynamic analysis, there's definitely um, you know a problem somewhere. It's up. It's it's just a question of whether that that code path is actually you know. Um, exploitable is, is the real question. Otherwise, uh, sometimes fuzzing will actually, most of the times, will actually detect uh, a flaw in a specific code path. Um, so static analysis and dynamic analysis are kind of uh, complementary. They, they are uh, recommended uh, for, you know, as a, as a good security practice, it's recommended that you run both static analysis and dynamic analysis. Sometimes uh, people even recommend uh, as a good security practice to you know, teach your static analysis, um, the findings that you, uh, you know, get out of your dynamic analysis tools like fuzzing. So, uh, you know, so that you get the best of both worlds. Um, so with that, let's uh, talk a little bit about the history of fuzzing in QEMU. Um, so QEMU is not new to fuzzing. There has been uh, some work in this area in different subsections of uh, the QEMU code base. Um, some of the examples uh, that are mentioned on this slide include things like uh, the QCOW2 fuzzer. This was integrated in uh, 2014. Then around 2015, uh, there were some patches to the Megasas virtual device layer. Uh, there was not a lot of uh, in, in, information as to how this, uh, this worked, but it's uh, probably a modified version of uh, QEMU with uh, you know, with AFL integrated, that was able to detect some bugs in the in the PCI bar space uh, for Megasas. Uh, more recently, um, we had work uh, in 2019. Uh, basically, Dima uh, presented about uh, what what IO device fuzzing using AFL at KVM Forum, uh, which uh, where he talks about um, how he used a setup of AFL a, a, a proxy and then. Uh, and the QMU test program using QTest to, uh, you know, first virtual device interfaces. And around the same time, uh, we also had Google Summer of Code that was going along uh, in parallel, I guess, in a, in a different approach where Alex, um, who is also presenting with me, um, you know, uh, was, uh, was kind of uh, researching and, uh, you know, trying to approach this problem using uh, libfuzzer, which is the more kind of the uh, LLVM backend. And we have, some few, we, we have some slides later on in our talk where we talk about um, those approaches. So, um, so based on our, uh, you know, past, uh, you, know, um, 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 you know, exposure to fuzzing, uh, we kind of identified some missing pieces. Uh, one of the most important missing pieces is uh, basically, you know, you don't want your fuzzing environment to be just limited to the developer's, uh, you know, personal workspace. The main benefit of fuzzing comes out of, uh, you know, making it more available, making it more generic so that all developers can, you know, utilize fuzzing uh, without major hiccups. And also, um, you could run fuzzing on a continuous basis, more like CI, because QEMU is a very, very active community with, you know, lots of patches coming in every day. Uh, so, uh, so, the, so, you know, integration brings up the topic of continuous integration. Uh, QEMU integration brings up the topic of uh, continuous integration. Uh, and so that's how, uh, you know, you are going to actually ca catch bugs as they come uh, in new patches, for example. And also the other important aspect, again, closely tied to continuous integration is where exactly are we going to run these uh, continuous integration tests. So, and that's, that's, that's kind of, you know, some of the, uh, you know, problems that kind of influenced uh, where this uh, KMU fuzzing work uh, took us. Um, but uh, before we go to, uh, you know, the solutions, uh, let's also talk about the challenges, um, uh, which probably have been mentioned at some point in, in other, you know, dis discussions as well. Um, 
uh, but uh, you know the more the more kind of obvious and uh, more kind of interesting uh, and important challenges with fuzzing QMU is QMU is not a regular or a general purpose just a simple piece of um, you know software that just does something specific. It's basically changing states all the time uh, based on guest behavior, and it implements a large amount of virtual devices. And all of these virtual devices have their own you know, quirks and they have their own implementations. And, you know, this just adds to the com complexity of the kind of input that you will pro provide uh, to, to QMU. Uh, so, the, so the fuzzer has to take care of this. Uh, the framework, uh, so although there's not a lot of, uh, you know, options when it comes to pre-built fuzzers, um, uh, we also need to decide on what would be a good fuzzing framework for QMU. Should we have a custom framework or should we just pick up something that's already out there? Um, you know, the advantage of picking up something out there is basically you, you, you know, save a lot of time, but the disadvantage is, of course, uh, now you have this challenge of kind of molding this pre-built fuzzer to work with QMU. Uh, and equally important is also the concept of state changes. Uh, so as I said uh, in the first bullet point, uh, you know, QMU is constantly changing state. And a fuzzer basically does not know about uh, you know states. And to have a reliable fuzzing run, you probably have to uh, feed in inputs at some consistent state of uh, of the virtual device or the subset of you know the virtual machine that you are dealing with. So these are these are some you know big problems with fuzzing not QMU, but you know any any complicated um, you know test program. And so we are gonna quickly cover. Uh, a little bit more um, in detail um, these these specific points. So, with respect to fuzzing frameworks, we have AFL, we have LibFuzzer that we discussed a little bit, um, uh, you know, in some of the previous slides. Um, so, the advantage of LibFuzzer is basically that it's uh, it's integrated into LLVM, and Google's OSS Fuzz runs nicely, um, you know, uh, with LibFuzzer. Um, and OSS Fuzz, as you might already know, is basically you know Google's infrastructure where you can submit your uh, you know, programs, your, your project, and they are going to run continuous integration on uh, fuzzing runs on your, on your uh, program. Um, so um, the, the disadvantage, as I mentioned before in the previous slide, is pre-built fuzzers are um, kind of, you know, they need some type of molding so that you can use them with your, with your uh, test program. Uh, the other option is obviously, you know, why not just use a custom fuzzer? It's a, you know, you you will start from scratch. You will um, you know have better integration, but obviously it has downsides as well. Uh, so uh, so this is a this is this is the this is the problem with the fuzzing framework. What kind of fuzzing framework should we use? The next challenge is um, uh, you know uh, the interface that we decided to fuzz. Uh, so we decided to fuzz the virtual devices, which we identified in the one of the previous slides that it is an important area to fuzz. Uh, and for all practical purposes, because we are using running general purpose OSs uh, as guests, uh, you know, virtual devices are most or more or less identical to real devices, real hardware out there. And all devices, as you already know, um, you know, have different mechanisms uh, to, uh, you know, to help uh, or, or to, to talk to them. So the most uh, the most common uh, you know legacy devices almost all the devices will implement some form of port io um, but at the same time uh, you also have uh, you know memory mapped io where you can map specific regions of the hardware to you know regular memory and uh, you know that also and you can write to these memory locations and they are going to you know enable some form of functionality in the hardware um, so the the way port IO and MMIO is configured is definitely is not is not set in stone. You know it, it depends from it varies from hardware to hardware. Uh, it might also depend on you know you know the device driver developer. So there's a lot of uh, you know uh, non standardization as to how you can enable the port IO space and the MMIO space, and, and that's uh, you know and that's something you have to know to efficiently fuzz right. So. Uh, on top of that, almost all devices today also have DMA, um, which basically uh, b lets the CPU kind of, you know, uh, save some cycles uh, or maybe use uh, use some CPU cycles for something more useful or maybe even get into a low power state while some data transfer is uh, going on. Now, 
as you might already know, DMA transfers, you know, deals with descriptors. These descriptors can be nested. They can be, you know, complicated chains of, uh, you know, memory locations that are fed to the DMA controller. So that also adds to the complexity of the input space that we are dealing with here. So now if you combine everything together, as you can imagine, for just even a, even a single virtual device, uh, we are talking about a space that is, you know, really, really, you know, huge. Uh, and that makes it very, very complicated. So the next um, uh, problem is the concept of a state. So as we discussed before, uh, you know, QMU is changing state all the time based on the events that are happening uh, or what kind of, uh, you know, uh, behavior the guest is, uh, you know, uh, displaying. And so the problem is, uh, fuzzing does not work that way, right? I mean, you always have to uh, get to a specific state before you put in an input and then see what coverage it gives you. If your state changes, your fuzzing runs won't be reliable. And that basically means that sometimes your fuzzing run wouldn't make any sense, or maybe even your bugs that you find with your fuzzing runs won't be you know, repeatable. So maintaining state is a very, very important topic. So how do we maintain state? Now, you know, KMU already gives you, you know, some existing um, you know, mechanisms. Like for example, you could probably reboot uh, the instance of uh, your guest machine that you, um, uh, that you are using for your fuzzing runs. Uh, KMU also provides you the concept of snapshots that is helpful in migration. You probably could reuse those here and you know have your fuzzing infrastructure integrated with the VM state uh, functionalities to save and restore snapshots. And you can also probably go one step ahead and try forking, where basically you fork off these fuzzing threads and they uh, you know uh, they this a common point and then they you know merge back fuzzing results back to the parent thread. So uh, so these are some of the challenges that uh, you know we identified uh, with respect to fuzzing uh, you know and and QMU. So with this, I think I would like to hand it over to Alex, who's going to talk a little bit about how we went ahead and started kind of looking at these problems in detail and what did we did about these problems uh, in, in terms of solutions. So Alex, do you want to take over? Yes, yes, thank you. It's useful to look at the ways we've been testing QMU uh, um, up to fuzzing because fuzzing is essentially doing the same thing as uh, these normal uh, virtual device tests, but it adds a uh, randomization component to that. Um, and in QMU, we have some, uh, some great APIs for, for uh, unit testing um, virtual devices, um, starting off with uh, QTest, for example, um, where QTest provides, uh, provides some instructions for performing input and output um, with devices uh, such as memory writes or port IO writes. Um, and it also lets you uh, control um, QMU's clock. Um, and uh, and this, is a, this is a great facility and there's lots of tests written uh, uh, using libqtest, but for some more complicated devices, uh, you quickly run into pro a problem because uh, complex devices require complex initialization and complex protocols. Um, so, uh, there's a library built out on top of uh, QTest called uh, libqos, which lets you um, leverage some uh, some common APIs in sort of a, uh, it's almost like a, um, a driver, a testing specific driver for, for a bunch of devices, which, which lets you um, bypass things like implementing uh, PCI enumeration and mapping PCI uh, base address registers um, for every single device because all of this is abstracted away into this nice API. Um, and through libqos, you can uh, you have access to, to these higher level APIs for bus access, uh, allocating uh, uh, space in, in RAM for, for data that will be transferred over DMA and things like um, uh, PCI, uh, controlling the PCI uh, configuration space. Um, so we have these really nice APIs and it makes sense to leverage them for fuzzing as well. So um, moving on, the, the way we built out the fuzzing framework within QMU um, is, is that we want to um, make it as simple as possible for somebody who's familiar with building out uh, QTests and QoS tests to, uh, to build fuzzing tests as well. 
Um, so the the basic API is very similar to to something like a Q test where you provide a name for your test, you provide some method for getting the arguments that you need to pass to QMU to set up the uh, the device that you want to fuzz, and then also you need to specify a function that will perform the actual fuzzing. And if we look at these actual uh, fuzzing functions, um, they look very similar to to something that uh, you would use to to test a device. Uh, the only difference is that you have uh, your function accepts a, uh, a randomized data buffer and the size of that buffer. And um, basically, the fuzzing target's job or the fuzzing function's job is to take that randomized buffer and convert it into these I/O actions. Um, with the device. So in this case, we're fuzzing uh, a PCI controller with, with two registers, basically the uh, CFG and the data registers. So you might take the first byte of, the, uh, of your input and interpret that as, uh, do I want to read or do I want to write from the register? And then the second byte might be, okay, which register do I want to write from to uh, out of these two registers? And then the third, uh, the, the, the last set of bytes might indicate you know, what data do I want to write to the register if I'm doing it right. Um, so it's quite similar to you know, a standard test that you would write. You just have to um, guide the test according to uh, some randomized data. Um, this one is actually, it's, it's basically doing exactly the same thing. It's more of a demonstration test, um, but it's leveraging the QoS framework uh, to, to do that. So you can see here that instead of these simple uh, Q test out, out or Q test in instructions uh, or, or function calls that we had on the prior, um, in the prior example, you can actually leverage libqs's bus APIs to, to, uh, to configure bytes. This really comes in handy when you're testing more sophisticated devices such as network controllers or, um, or uh, disk controllers. You can go uh, even further. So one thing that we've spent a lot of time doing is actually building out a uh, a generic uh, fuzzer program that leverages QTest, but instead of requiring the developer to build out a, a function for every single device that they wish to fuzz, they can just specify a couple environment variables. Um, the first one being, you know, the set of arguments that you want to pass to QMU to set up a virtual device, and then the second one being um, a a set of or a, a set of strings that basically. Uh, indicate the rules that you use to match the names of memory regions or objects um, that you want to fuzz. Um, and uh, we've we spent quite a bit of time uh, building out that fuzzer. And um, I'm not going to, going to go into too much detail about how that works under the hood, um, but it can actually generate some pretty interesting and, and complicated uh, inputs. So uh, for example, the one on the left is a real uh, uh, crash that it found for, for a network device where you can see how in the beginning it's performing all these out um, port IO instructions. It's basically automatically doing the, um, uh, the uh, PCI setup and mapping the base address registers for this device and then interacting with the memory mapped IO registers in orange. And then finally in the purple, um, this is actually it writing to a DMA buffer that will be read by um, by the network device. And then in this case, the bug was actually that the, the, the address in red is also a DMA address, but it, instead of being located in some free lo location in RAM, it happens to be um, overlapping the uh, memory mapped IO uh, uh, space of the device, which you can see if you just flip the endianness of those bytes uh, in your head. Um, we built out some scripts that uh, convert um, these, uh, the resulting crashes into normal QTest test, test crisis, cases. And, and we also minimize those crashes to remove bytes that uh, are not needed to reproduce the crash. Um, and the crash reproducers are usually small enough that they can be included inside an email uh, in a report to, to the mailing list or, or even inside a commit message. Um, which you can, you can see here on this uh, small movie where basically as a, as a developer who's receiving a bug report, all you have to do is copy and paste a, a command from an email to, to get a reproducer trace so that you can uh, then look at in GDB or attach some tracing events to it.
Um, and our project has already been accepted to OSS fuzz. This means that QMU will be fuzzed basically uh, all the time. And uh, any, any new code that gets upstreamed uh, will be fuzzed. And hopefully, we can catch any new issues that show up before, before the next release. Um, and using the fuzzing approach that, uh, that we've developed and the fuzzing frameworks that we've developed, we've not a, only have we been able to find brand new bugs, but we've also built out reproducers for bugs that have been reported a long time ago, but um, there was no reliable reproducer for them. Um, and because of the reproducer that we found, now it's a lot easier for the developer to work on fixing those bugs. And we've also found some bugs that, um, that uncovered some deep um, problems in, in some of the architectural decisions uh, in uh, QMU, such as um, the way devices access, um, access data over DMA, and also the memory access API itself um, with, with some problems with the alignment and memory access sizes. Um, so far, we've reported uh, over 50 bugs on, on Launchpad, and six bugs have been um, assigned CVE IDs. Um, and we're still very much trying to work out how to deal with reporting these bugs in the future and working out a process because um, fuzzing on OSS fuzz is still quite a new uh, concept uh, for QMU. So we're uh, actively looking for input on the best ways to, to get reports to a developer that can fix them uh, as smoothly as possible. Um, and in the future, there's, there's so much stuff that I'd love to talk about. And I think there's a lot of places where uh, this work can go. Um, and just to mention a few, uh, devices are often hooked up to complicated backends such as uh, Spice, VNC, uh, Slurp. Um, we want to be able to fuzz those as well. Um, we also want to be able to fuzz migration code. So uh, save VM, load VM, and uh, VM state descriptors uh, and uh, reboots. We also still don't have a great way to uh, to fuzz uh, to to reproduce crashes that require you know thousands and thousands and thousands of interactions because um, libfuzzer sets a cap of uh, 4k or 60k for each input that it tries to use to fuzz, um, and then we can also talk about um, you know fuzzing fuzzing devices that rely on a kernel. Uh, components in the kernel such as the vhost and uh you know some devices are moving out of the process with with stuff uh, like multi-process key move and um vhost user um and uh and and i i think overall there's there's still a lot of work to be done if anybody is interested in any of these topics uh would love to uh talk to you about it um so alex um how would you suggest somebody who's uh you know not very, very familiar with, uh, you know, the fuzzing infrastructure in QMU, how would you suggest they get, you know, started to, you know, possibly kind of even, uh, uh, you know, contribute to these topics? Right, uh, awesome question, uh, Bandan. Um, I, uh, so here are our, our contact details, first of all, and we're, we're always happy to talk about um, uh, these bugs. If you want to take a look on your own, uh, we have documentation uh, for the fuzzer. Uh, it should be pretty easy to find it. But really, all you need to get started with building the fuzzer and writing a new fuzzer is reasonably recent version of um, uh, Clang. Um, we have some very simple examples, as as I showed uh, earlier on in the uh, in the presentation. Um, and and yeah, as I said, we're we're really happy to talk to anybody who's interested in this. I want to give a uh, huge thanks to everybody who. Uh, who helps with reviewing the code and working on the bugs um, uh, that we reported. And with that, uh, I guess uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, we'd be happy to take them.